Rotation in Guild Wars 2 PvP can be difficult to understand because the primary objective of capturing 3 nodes will require varying amounts of resources from your team to try to get as much value out of the map as possible. With 5 players per team and the diverse class system of Guild Wars 2, this can mean splitting up in different combinations and sizes depending on the objective and which enemy or enemies meet you there. Moving between these objectives and deciding whether to group up or to split is called rotation, and because certain classes or builds can specialize in certain situations, certain roles have arisen which can be simplified into four basic categories. There are the DPS, who deal damage, get kills, and scale up in larger fights. There are the supports, who sustain those larger fights and keep their team alive. There are the duelists, who are efficient node holders that can pressure small scale fights in 1v1s. And then there are roamers, who progress the map looking to get isolated kills quickly using mobility and burst damage. If you want a more detailed explanation of the general role interactions, then check out the extended intro of my how to support video, or if you want a more specific explanation of any of those roles, then check out the playlist link below in the description. Also, remember that speculating on what role players are using or playing as depends on what build they're playing more so than their class, and the builds that people generally play can depend heavily on the current meta which can change over time. So even if you aren't playing meta builds, you will need to know them to understand how to rotate around the other players and roles in the match optimally. So when you see a certain class, it may be a DPS in this meta, but maybe some changes to balance or to the meta may make it more of a roamer or duelist in another meta. This is why it's important to understand how to scout out other players' builds just by seeing what weapons they're using, what traits they're using, and what buffs they have on them. You can check out my other videos on each class matchup to learn how to better identify what build or role a certain player is using, which will also be linked below in the description. As for this video, I will be going over the role of DPS in PvP, how to play it, and how to build it. DPS usually have lots of AoE damage and boon removal or other ways to break the defenses of the enemy to help their team focus targets in large fights. Because of this, they can't afford too much in the way of self-sustain or mobility. This makes them slow, predictable, but very dangerous if you don't react to their presence. DPS is actually the easiest role to play rotationally. What I mean by this is that any place you rotate to on the map will generally give you some value because getting kills is a good solution to most situations. If you go into a 1v1, you can still beat a support, you can beat a roamer, or you can beat another DPS, but if you rotate into a 1v1 against another duelist, however, there is much greater risk and less chance that you'll actually win. So you generally don't want to. For example, if you're 1v1ing as a DPS and there's a team fight going on across the map, you're spending all your time and damage optimized for AoE situations and pressuring the slower DPS and supports. Instead of putting that damage somewhere it gets more value, a DPS in a 1v1 with a duelist is putting their damage into someone who is meant to survive and stall and waste time. As a DPS, you are also susceptible to roamers if you aren't currently being supported. So if you get stuck in a 1v1 with a duelist as a DPS and the enemy roamer swings by, you'll most likely die. However, if your roamer swings by to kill their duelist, there is still a high chance that the duelist survives if they forfeit the node immediately. But then you're put in an awkward situation where you have to hold the node as a DPS to get value out of pressuring the duelist off the node with the 2v1. If the duelist pushes back in to the 1v1 after the roamer leaves, you'll just lose the node anyways. In this way, it makes your team's rotations very awkward for you to take 1v1s as a DPS because it's not really worth it for your team to help you, but also you kind of need help. This is why I say that it's not worth it to 1v1 as a DPS. But if you do manage to win against a duelist, because you counter them or you outplay them, despite your role, 
disadvantage, the ability to get the kill may be worth it, but at the same time you could be getting kills at a team fight which would result in more presence for your team because winning a team fight can result in multiple kills with less risk of being ganked alone. In general though, as a DPS you want to be in even fights of like 2v2 or more players or outnumbering the enemy in like a 2v1 or 3v2. DPS can survive outnumbered situations with a support peeling for them, like in a 2v3 or a 3v4, but generally this means that the DPS is playing to survive rather than to kill, and their role and build is all designed around getting kills. But if a DPS and a support are in a 2v3, this can often still be a good situation because the DPS can counter pressure so that the three enemy players have to play more carefully, giving your support more time to get out their heals. Ideally though, you want to be forcing kills and then while the enemy is gone on respawn, you let your support or duelists capture the objectives while you go looking for more kills. So here are some simplified priorities that a DPS should be thinking of, with the higher priorities being worth more at the top, but when combined together the lower ones could be worth more. So first of all, it is don't die. Then number two is get kills. Third priority is keep your team alive. And the lowest priority is to stand on nodes. You will notice that getting kills is a lower priority than not dying. While your role is to get kills, dying often not only prevents you from getting kills, but also allows the enemy to freely kill your team. Because a DPS is such a high priority target in fights, you'll often be focused and need to recognize when you are the target and use positioning to survive. A dead DPS does no damage and therefore does not get kills and does not counter pressure the enemy, letting them play much more aggressively to get kills on the rest of your team. Also, because the DPS is probably the most useful role in your team, since damage is always useful. A support's priority is to keep its DPS alive more so than itself. Granted, a support shouldn't die if they can stop it, but given the choice between a DPS and a support, you usually choose the DPS. This is why survival is essential as a DPS. However, that does not mean you should play passively. DPS need to be aggressive to get their kills and need to overextend in situations where they think they can secure a kill as long as they have the cooldowns to do so. Often you will be in situations where you're unsure of how much you can overextend to get a kill and may be punished with death. Over the course of a match you can learn the enemy playstyles, what the general level of danger each situation presents, and how aggressive you can afford to play. This is why a DPS should always start matches playing somewhat passively until they understand the situations and then go more aggressive as the match and their comfort with the situations progresses. Let your supports be the ones to stand on node at first because their lives are not quite as valuable, but as soon as the enemy draws their attention to the rest of your team, you should go on the offensive. This is also very related to the other priorities of keeping your team alive and not dying. Because your counter pressure is important to your team survival, almost as much as your support's healing and cleansing is, you want to still risk your life to give your team presence. If your teammates die because you're valuing your life too much, then you'll follow suit because you're now outnumbered and don't have the support of your team. So your life and your team's life are very intertwined. But since you have more control over whether you die or not, focus on your survival first. Lastly, there is the priority of standing on nodes, because you want to be getting advantages out of the kills you get, and it is much easier to get kills when the enemy is outnumbered since they have less support or less counter pressure. The last thing a DPS should do is stand on node. It's a waste of the advantages they gain from winning the objective. Even though a duelist and a support should probably capture nodes before a DPS does, a roamer is even lower priority to capture nodes than a DPS. This is because DPS are usually slower than roamers, so a roamer gets more value out of moving out and making plays around the map. And since roamers are also very aggressively oriented, they can often get just as much done where a DPS would. 
especially if they're in an advantageous situation after a winning fight. But those situations really aren't that difficult to play around anyway since you're already winning. The real question is, how should a DPS rotate after losing a fight? If you're leaving a fight that is lost, it means your team most likely has some of its players on respawn, which means they'll be near the home node, or the one closest to their spawn. It is usually best to regroup around your home node as a DPS because that is where your team can provide you with reinforcements fastest. Going to the far node or the node closest to the enemy spawn point is extremely dangerous because as a DPS, you lack the mobility to really escape if their team decides to regroup at their home node. You can end up dying and staggering your team. A team is staggered in the context of Guild Wars 2 PvP essentially when that team is delayed the ability to regroup because different allies die at separate times. While one person is dead on your team, you're essentially four players on the map. If the enemy team pushes in five players into your remaining four, you will be at a big disadvantage and could lose more members of your team. If right as your fifth member respawns, you lose another member because you're outnumbered, then you're still 4v5 because now your team's regroup has been staggered. It is usually the job of a duelist or roamer to split the enemy team to allow easier regroups, but a DPS can play very safely to prevent being staggered in these situations by going towards their home or even to their spawn. If there are no potential places where you can get a kill on the map, it is better to just regroup after losing a fight. Also, this idea of staggering the enemy is the same reason why you want to play aggressive as a DPS rather than just capturing a node. Also, this idea of staggering the enemy is the same reason why you want to play aggressive as a DPS rather than just capturing nodes. But if there is no one better to capture a node, then you should do it. Now let's talk about how to build a DPS. There are two types of DPS. There are power and condition DPS. Hybrid damage dealers do exist, but they're often more condition oriented or more of a duelist or roamer. All DPS builds will want to give out the vulnerability condition to enemies because it not only increases their power and condition to the target, but also gives their team more damage to that target, which makes focusing targets much more effective. It can be cleansed, but if the enemy is cleansing vulnerability, it may mean that they won't be able to cleanse another condition. This is the main idea of creating a condition DPS build. Because conditions deal their damage over time, they can be countered by cleanses. So playing around the enemy cleansing your damage can help your conditions stick for longer and deal more damage. Condition builds will want to have many debilitating conditions as well as damaging conditions. If you only have damaging conditions, then they can easily be recognized and cleansed when necessary. If you have some cripples, chills, weakness, or blinds as well, the enemy may not be able to cleanse your damaging conditions. This is called covering your conditions. If you have to cleanse 5 conditions, it's going to be a lot more taxing than if you have to cleanse 2 conditions, even if the 2 conditions deal much more damage. In this way, Cover conditions are better versus experienced players that know how to handle conditions well and run builds with plenty of condition cleanses. Builds with low amounts of cover conditions but higher stacks of them will often kill players or builds without good cleanse capability or that use their cleanses improperly. You can also play around cleanses not only by diversifying the spread of conditions you deal but also their pacing. If you know the enemy has a large condition cleanse utility such as the Guardian's Contemplation of Purity, which converts all conditions on them into boons, then you'll want to save your large condition burst for after it's been used by gradually placing conditions on them rather than blowing them all at once. So condition pacing and cover conditions are very important to a Condi DPS playstyle. As already mentioned, vulnerability and AoE are important to DPS classes, but to specifically Condi DPS, you'll want to have a little bit more self-sustain than a power build. Conti DPS is better in longer sustained fights because of the damage over time nature of conditions. If you can't survive long enough for your damage to manifest itself, it isn't worth it. The main PvP stats that Condi DPS take are Wizard, Carrion, Sage, and Rabid because they're the most balanced. 
Sinister, Grieving, and Rampager are very squishy, and as I said, you'll get much more damage out by surviving. So generally, you don't use these, but they are options. Some really good sigils are the Exposure and Doom sigils because they will put out Vulnerability and Poison, which can serve as extra cover conditions on the target. Agony, Confusion, Misery, and Venom can all increase the duration of individual damaging conditions, which you can decide which are more valuable to improve, depending on your build. Runes will very much depend on which build you are, but by filtering through condition damage in the search bar is generally a good start. Power of DPS builds rely on more instant damage, but have more visible animations that an enemy can react to. So while Kondi DPS builds want cover conditions and to play around cleanse, power builds want immediacy and control effects to ensure their damage lands. Rather than keeping track of condition cleanses, Power DPS keeps track of the enemy dodges and stun breaks. Landing your entire damage combo on someone who is stunned can often mean their death, but to get a Power DPS to have this much presence, you need to sacrifice a lot of survivability. Having multiple forms of CC and lots of damage modifiers can stack up multiplicatively. If you have more combos and CC to land your combos, then the enemy has dodges and stun breaks, they will eventually die. So it is important that a power DPS not only invest into damage heavily, but to go somewhat overkill on that. You will want three main stats, power, precision, and ferocity. Power is the most important stat, then precision and ferocity, depending on whether your build can get precision for free somewhere. You can take Berserker if you can gain some vitality elsewhere, otherwise you'll want to take Marauder so you don't instantly die. Remember not dying as your highest priority. Demolisher is also possible if you need the extra survivability, but you already have a decent amount of vitality. Any amulet without power, precision, and ferocity just simply isn't providing enough damage for the role of power DPS. Fury is the most important boon for power DPS because it gives 20% crit chance, and if your build isn't giving this to itself, it will be doing a lot less damage. Quickness is also a really good boon for power DPS to make their damage go out faster than the enemy can react, but not all classes have easy access to quickness. Once you have a reasonable potential and intent to kill, then you can go for more team support, mobility, or self-sustain. It's just nice to have some versatility in a DPS build because not always will you be fighting stationary opponents with a pocket healer to attend to your wounds you'll want a little bit of independence for situations that are not in your favor. The first build that I'm going to show is a condition and power hybrid herald. So the idea is I have the doom and exposure sigil and the cleansing and the energy sigil which are all swap sigils and I can abuse the fact that legend swapping counts as a weapon swap and because of the ordering of my legend swap that I can do before my weapon swap I can essentially get all four of my sigils to proc every nine seconds rather than every 18. So you can get a lot of value from that from the ordering of your legend and weapon swaps. You've also got the wizard amulet which gives power precision and condition damage. The precision is pretty nice on this build because there is a lot of fury as well. So I have a decent amount of crit chance for my power damage and fury will also give me condition damage and power damage increases. So that's one thing that's really important with hybrid builds is you want modifiers for both power and condition damage. And you'll see that might is also a really good hybrid boon because it gives condition damage and power. And while this trait has been nerfed over time, it is still pretty good for hybrid builds. And you'll also see that this build has a lot of condition application. So whenever I swap legends, I will do an invoke torment, which will give torment, it will give poison and burning, which is all very good damaging conditions. But then on top of that, I will also have the song of the mists which will give me a cover condition of vulnerability which I can get anyways from the exposure sigil so it'll give even more vulnerability when I swap into the shiro stance and then when I go into the dragon stance 
I will get chill, which will give torment and burning. So it's like two burning there. So it's a lot of damage just from the no animation legend swap. And you've also got your weapon skills and your facet skills to give out a lot of other effects. So mostly you're going to get damage on mace from your two skill and your three skill. You have your four and five to kind of like set up combos. But one thing that's really important is doing your searing fisher into your sword too because this is a combo finisher whirl which will do burning bolts if you stand on top of your target to give out tons of burning so this is a really good combo to do is you'll do your uh, mace 2 and then you'll legend swap and then you'll weapon swap for your quadra swap and then you'll use your sword 2 inside your mace 2 and you can get a lot of damage especially on down bodies so you have a lot of cleave in this build there is also a decent amount of sustain on this build because of the herald specialization and the glint stance so you have the ability to use facet of light which is one of the strongest heals in the game you also have a lot of boon support for your allies with draconic echo which allows your facet passives to keep giving out boons after you just use their actives and then you have the Shiro Stance, which is going to give you a lot of chasing potential to allow you to feel a little bit like a roamer, to be honest. But this is more of a DPS build. So as a DPS, you generally want to go to the mid node because the larger fights tend to go to mid at the start of the match. Now obviously if someone goes to your home node or a group of players or enemies goes to your home node, then you'll want to react. So here I am attacking the enemy guardian off node. The enemy is actually capping node while we're chasing these kills, but it's not really my job to stand on node, so I'm just trying to get kills and stay on the focus target. So I am chasing the kill. Now we're fighting on the enemy node now, but that's not my problem. I just need to get kills for my team and we may be losing our 1v1 home or far but that's not really my job either, right? I'm just trying to look for kills and try to get momentum on the map so that my 1v1ers and supports or whatever who are going to capture the nodes can have the advantage because at the moment they're not having the advantage, right? Because they've given up the nodes. So we're just looking for the kill on this Renegade and I have a lot of condition burst and while the enemy guardian is a support here, like we have support and they have support, um, they are getting very heavily pressured because the amount of cleansing that they're needing to do over time is they're kind of running out of it, right? So we're eventually going to get the kill here. I have insane cleave with my hollow here. So we're like two DPS and a support versus a support and a DPS. So that's a really good situation for us. Whereas if it was like a support, a roamer, and a DPS, it maybe be a little bit less um, you know, momentum. So we go into here. Our duelist is losing their 1v1 and so this becomes a 3v2 because we just won mid so we're as I said before you're gaining advantages and momentum out of kills that you gained prior to the situation because we just won mid and they capped mid and now they're respawning we can 3v2 this so we're just looking for the kill and we're just snowballing off of that and so at this point, yeah, the enemy team starts to finally respawn and regroup though, so we're no longer in like a really advantage situation. So it's an even fight now. We still want to be focusing a target, so I'm trying to group with my team. And yeah, they're actually dying on home, so this is maybe not a good situation, but I'm just trying to... If anything, I'm pressuring their renegade off of my team. But yeah, it looks like my team is starting to die, so I, I kite and try to survive. I use my heal skill there to try to get them off of me. Just using terrain here. It looks like my support guardian is supporting me so I'm actually pretty safe now so I can play very aggressively on this renegade. I do my quad swap burst and land a really good axe 4 and my guardian lands a really nice line of warding as well. But um, I miss some of my abilities there to not secure the kill. Now the bell is up and we're outnumbered in like a 2v3, but as I said, DPS plus a support is actually a pretty good comp. So I'm just trying to peel for my 
support as hard as I can with you know CCs. I can give out boons and heal with my shield and facets. And yeah, we're just gonna try to counter pressure. Normally you want to kill what's on node when Bell is up because Bell is like a cap it and forget it. Whereas like other nodes on the map are more like you want to sustain a fight around them. So it's not that important to stand on the node, but with the bell, it's very important that you stand on the node. So I am trying to make sure that at least one person is standing on the node at any time. But I'm also, because of that, the enemy has to stand on it too, which means I'm able to land a lot of my damage and DPS in team fights that are really constricted like this it's able to get all of its damage out very easily. So as you can see, we're getting tons of kills here. And I think that's like what, three or four kills that we've gotten. So at this point, we're basically, this is a snowball, right? We can now capture all the nodes and we've also just won the last objective. However, the enemy 1v1er is decapping us at mid and they're going to go defend home. So instead I go to home and I try to kill the enemy 1v1er because this is kind of like a bad play normally, but because we've just killed their whole team, now is a good time to try to go for this kill. So we're just gonna chase this. This is like a 2v1 or a 3v1 because, well, our NG didn't uh, full cap home. They just decapped it, which is probably a good play too because we don't wanna waste too much time because now the enemy is respawning on mid, but I do wanna make sure that I get this kill because I invested time into it and Ellie's are very cooldown reliant on their sustain. So if we get out their, their cooldowns, then we wanna you know invest for the kill. So we get a nice CC here and that allows us to get the kill. My team is now going into far in a 3v4. So they're at a disadvantage, but since we have support there, they can last long enough for me to get there. And I'm actually gonna swing by mid and capture or decapture that and the bell is actually coming up as well. And the bell is more important than any of the nodes on the map. So I'm gonna go there instead of going to the team fight at far. While, yeah, this isn't really my priority to stand on nodes, the bell has higher priority than a single player's priority, right? Because it is a secondary objective that can't really give you a lot of points. So it's gonna give me 50 points. And since no one's going to contest it, yeah, I'll take the 50 points for free. However, my team is losing the map at far, right? Because they were outnumbered that whole time. So we gave up far, but we gained the bell, which in my opinion is worth it. So at this point, I'm going to trade nodes with the enemy duelist. I could go to home and defend my node, but that's a unfavorable matchup because that's a duelist and I'm a DPS. So I really don't want to defend my home node. I just want to trade my uh, home node for their mid node decap and they'll probably full capture home but I'm just gonna go and team fight afterwards so that I don't get stuck in that 1v1 so I'm now doing the killing portion of my role again and we're just gonna chase these kills and because we get these kills we're able to snowball once again into the map which means we can take advantage situations where we're either outnumbering the enemy or we've already got the node so we can play in a more valuable situation because if we own the node doesn't matter like if the fight stalls out because we're winning since we own the node so yeah we do get kills though because we're outnumbering and yeah we're gonna chase this kill get a jade wins here and that's gonna secure the kill and yeah at this point i mean the we can just pretty much zerg to win because we don't really need to split up because we're always staggering the enemy and getting snowball potential or momentum because the enemy is always on respawn, right? So yeah, at this point, the match is pretty much over. The enemy side noder is holding their home node or our home node, but we don't really need to go there anymore because we already own two nodes and we're at such an advantage in the point uh, lead right now that we don't really need to go for the third point we can definitely play well you can play two point at most times in a match unless you're really far behind and yeah at this point we really don't need to play anything else and our support should really be watching the mid node a little bit better than that but they give it up and 
it's not really my job to watch nodes so I kind of trust them to watch it but it's fine because we can just get it again just now we have a team fight at our mid node so our Ellie's gonna watch far probably and we're just gonna chase kills here and we'll win the match eventually so that's yeah that's pretty much how you play a DPS you want to be looking for larger fights yet out your damage and pressure on the key targets with your team and then from there you want to try to find more kills right you want to get kills that are predicated off of the situation that you've already created right because if you pressure someone off and then say for example you don't actually get a kill and you just pressure someone off well then whoever stayed behind to defend the objective that you pressured that other player off of well they're now outnumbered so even if you don't get kills just pressuring someone out so that they have to disengage is good enough and then you want to you know retarget with your team and start to get kills with that coordination this next build i'll be showing is a power reaper which has a lot of melee burst with the reaper shroud and then it has poke with the axe and staff weapons so I'll be using the Marauder Amulet, which on Necromancer is really important because if you have more vitality, you have more Shroud, and Shroud not only gives you more sustain, but also gives you more damage because in Reaper Shroud, that's where you get your damage. So it's really important that you take Marauder and not Berserker because you actually do get more damage on Marauder because unless the enemy isn't hitting you at all, you're going to want to be in Shroud as long as you can. Then I take the Rune of Speed, which gives more vitality, which is nice, but also it will make your Swiftness, which you get from the Warhorn and the Spectral Walk, to give you more effectiveness on that, which allows you to chase kills and to kite and survive. I'll also be taking the Sigil of Opportunity and the Sigil of Exposure for more damage in the Axe Weapon Set, and then Energy and Escape for the Staff, which is more useful for kiting and poking. Then for the traits I will be taking soul marks and fear of death so fear is really nice because it allows you to hit targets while they're cc'd so there's a lot of cc on this build and the duration increase of the fear allows you to not only have more pressure on the target but to force them to use their stun breaks because if they don't then they're going to take that pressure. So you have a lot of fears with the Staff 5. You also have the Spectral Ring, which can fear multiple times. And then your Shroud 3 will obviously fear. And that can, even if it doesn't amount to anything, it can bait out cooldowns. And that's really important for a power build to bait out cooldowns, especially stun breaks, which can be used against fears. Because if you can finally land your big stun into your burst combo, then it's really good because you do have big stuns from the Shroud 5 and I am using the Chill to the Bone Elite on this build which is a 3 second stun. So if you land that and then you go into Shroud and you do your Shroud Auto which do a lot of damage then you can secure the kill right there. You also have increased crit chance and ferocity while in Shroud so one thing this build lacks is Fury but I make up for that with Death Perception, which gives 33% more crit in Shroud, so I go up to like 85%, which is pretty good. Did I also mention that Reaper's Onslaught gives basically permanent quickness while you're in Shroud? So you do tons of damage, as well as 300 more Ferocity in Shroud. So you've got 600 Ferocity in Shroud and 85% crit chance. So yeah, you're doing a lot of damage. And you've also got a decent amount of sustain with Vampiric Presence, which will give your allies support as well. And Lifesteal in general is just really good because it does damage and it heals you. And then you've also got a lot of Condition Cleanse on this build with the Staff 4. You've got Consumed Conditions and you've got Unholy Martyr. So it is a decently sustainable build without support. But yeah, if it's outnumbered, then you're going to have a lot of troubles. And that's when you're going to have to get creative with Spectral Walk and your summon flesh worm to survive in those situations. But when you are playing for the kill and you are in the right situation, you have a lot of CC with Spectral Ring, you have Chilled to the Bone, 
I choose this over Lich Form because Lich Form, people know how to play around it nowadays and there's like Reflex and Chill to the Bone kind of goes through a lot of ways and you can actually bait out dodges if you precast Chill to the Bone and then cancel it. So it does give you a lot of play potential and Lich Form is a lot more predictable so I like Chill to the Bone and if it does land then you've got a 3 second stun which you can land a lot of your burst into. So it's a pretty good build. So on the Reaper build, you generally don't want to go into the immediate first fight just straight up without Shroud because you're very vulnerable when you don't have Shroud and it takes a little bit longer for you to get your first bits of Shroud in the first fight. So that's usually when it's also the most volatile because the enemy team has all their cooldown they're jumping on you immediately. So I go for a little bit of a skirmish off to the side with their hollow, just to gain some shroud in a smaller scale situation. But I do realize that I'm going to get jumped on by a ranger as well. So I head towards far and do a little bit of a juke with my spectral walk. I put down my worm finally and port up, but I see that my team is already dead even though they're technically outnumbering here but it was actually even because our guardian went to far. So we're just going to try to peel out of mid with my ally here. Make sure that we don't die. If we play for sides, which is basically not playing for mid and trying to split the enemy team, then we'll be better off in this losing fight scenario. But I push in slightly, not really into mid, but just kind of trying to get presence for our team in roads. Maybe I get a kill and that means that we can push in the mid easily. But if I just push in the mid while this one guardian is on me, then yeah, it's going to be a lot harder to actually get into mid. So my teammates push in the mid and their guardian is low, but I'm not going to just push in the mid with them. I almost have a kill here, so I want to secure this kill because I invested a lot into it and you know, they're out of cooldowns probably. So I chase the kill. I see that their second Dragon Hunter is now out of cooldowns and I use Chill to the Bone to get the stun and that allows our team to get the kills there and I immediately leave the fight. Now I know that there's potential for the enemy to rotate into that fight but since I see that there's one or more coming in from the far node, generally my team is going to be able to handle those downstate bodies. Now all of them leave mid for some reason. So in reality, they couldn't handle it. But yeah, the idea that I'm trying to show here is that I don't waste time. I try to get momentum for us on the map. As soon as I get the kill, I let my teammates deal with the downstate body because at that point, there's not really much I can do. But yeah, if there was a chance that our teammates didn't know how to handle the downstate body or there was potential of them being rezzed, then I would definitely stay and help cleave it out. Now here my teammates are chasing a ranger around back and i see that they're outnumbered slightly at mid and they're kind of low as well yeah they're actually dying on mid so i really don't want to go into mid i'm just going to keep fighting off node but i see also that i'm another enemy is going to come in so i have to be careful here yeah my teammates are dying at mid so i'm just trying to keep some distance with staff while also pressuring targets get a really nice chill to the bone and that allows me to almost get the kill here on their dragon hunter. I want to be careful of the burns but because this is another DPS build it's not like they have a lot of sustain you know both my build and their build are kind of lacking in sustain so it's not like my damage is wasted here by pressuring them in the roads but yeah my team ends up dying finally at mid so I decide to go to far and far is going to be another 1v1 with the dragon hunter and because this isn't a duelist i can be a little bit more of an advantage situation than normally a duelist would be so i or sorry than a dps would be so if i go against a duelist then i won't be having a good time but since this is like a dps and there's not really much else my team can do anyways because they keep feeding into mid and dying and i can't really do anything about that I just decide to sort of play the role of a duelist as a necromancer, which you can kind of do because necromancers scale very well in small fights, but 
Yeah, now I'm in a 1v2 and it's very dangerous. I do get the down though and the hollow tries to res and I get the chill to the bone down and I try to stop them from resing but I don't have enough damage because I just left shroud and that's unfortunate because now I'm going to be outnumbered and I have to sort of try to survive here while my ranger goes for the beast and yeah I have my worm off to the side if I really need it so I'm playing actually pretty aggressively here because I know that if worse comes to worse, I can just use my worm. And yeah, there I finally decided to use it. And I probably should have done that sooner, to be honest. But I, I think my guardian cleansed me or something there, which was pretty nice. But now my team is starting to win mid. And I'm continuing to take this 1v1 with the dragon hunter. And this is kind of like showing you how a DPS is sort of like the next best thing to a duelist. If you don't have a duelist on your team, or people who know how to play the role of a duelist rather, then a DPS can absolutely play the role of a duelist. Or if your team doesn't really win team fights, even though you are providing presence to them in, as a DPS, you can kind of like play as this far node pusher as long as you don't die. And I play very safely so that I do not, because if I do die, then I relinquish my presence on the map. So getting kills isn't really my highest priority because I can't really get them in these large fights because my teammates are not going to survive. There's not enough sustain on my team to survive those large fights long enough for me to do my damage. So I end up going into smaller fights which will last longer and therefore allow me to get more value out of the longer sustained damage that my build has. So in these smaller fights I'm taking 1v1 against this hollow and yeah our team is dying now so I have to kind of watch out for being plus one but I go into shroud here I do have a, yeah it's kind of like a 2v2 now which is actually good I'd prefer a 2v2 than a 1v1 but I have to be careful here the enemy engineer is kind of using terrain here and trying to survive so it's good on them so I need to probably well I'm trying to play aggressive but we're, we're on different targets here which is kind of bad we should be targeting no one has a target up and we're just both taking two separate 1v1s rather than 2v2ing which is kind of bad we should be focusing the same target so yeah it's another important thing as a DPS is learning how to target enemies for your team so that you can actually focus but yeah, they they leave me to another 1v1 and our team just caps our home for free and we kind of like relinquish our hold on mid really, we're just kind of leaving that. So maintaining this 1v1, I see I out of the you know corners of my eyes, I see that I am getting attacked by someone who's rotating in here. So I do back up a little bit I don't see them here there yeah they're finally coming in here and it looks like a yeah it's another DH and I see my teammate just died here so immediately that signals to me that I'm going to be outnumbered and not going to get support anytime soon so I start kiting off node immediately and using terrain using my cooldowns and just trying to get out because if I die then my teammates will die as I already mentioned so I start to go into mid Hopefully my teammates can give me some support there. And it looks like there's a minion master on mid, which is not a bad matchup for a reaper because I have enough damage to cleave them while they have no stun breaks basically as a minion master. And reapers have a lot of CC here. I land my executioner scythe and just do tons of damage into that three second stun there. So it's pretty good that we got that kill there. I leave my teammates to deal with the down body though it may have been a bad idea because I already know they have a history of not handling situations very well. However, it is a trade-off and they do eventually win it themselves. You kind of have to trust your team to some extent to be able to win. So the trust that I leave them with the down state body is enough for me to get the decap on far. And now I will be in a 1v1 versus a Condi Ranger and while this is not the worst matchup it's definitely not a good matchup because they have a lot of 
condies that they can just put on the node, right? And so they have an advantage in situations where they're playing around the node. However, my teammate comes in and we can get this kill here with a really nice chill to the bone stun. And they do have a, yeah, they have the Scourge here, which they're gonna res with Transfusion. So they do get alive again, but we own the node and the match is ending very soon. So owning the node is very important. So I make sure to watch the node. Now my teammates are going for home and they're going for beast. This could decide the match, but at this point, it's my job to hold far because if we get home and we get the beast, but we lose far, we could still lose the game. So I am just trying to pressure the enemy and prevent them from going to the rest of my team. But if I see one of them go back to far, then I'll want to defend that, right? Because it's not my job to do it technically, but I am taking up the role of a duelist. So it becomes my job to watch nodes, if that makes sense. But yeah, my team ends up losing home, but because I hold far, we are able to get the win and they of course get the beast, which is very important as well. The next build is a burn dragon hunter, which will be using the carrion amulet and the traveler rune. Guardians don't really have a lot of access to movement speed, so a movement speed rune is pretty good on guardian usually, and traveler is just better for condition builds than links. You also have the Sword Torch with Intelligence and Smoldering, which is really good for the Radiant Straight Line because if you crit, so that's why you need Intelligence with the Carrying Amulet, you need to crit with your Torch, and that will give you a secondary Torch 4, and then you can just pulse out tons of burnings and also shoot out your Zealot's Flame, which can do a lot of power and condition damage especially if it crits with your intel sigil. So you want to be just basically standing on top of your targets and just spamming torch 4 on them and you can use the sword 2 to chase. And then you have amplified wrath which will increase the duration of your burns as well and the damage of those burns. So there's a lot of burning synergy on this build and the sigil of smoldering obviously but this build is sort of singular in its conditions that it gives out. So I am going to try to sneak in some cover conditions where I can, but for the most part, it mainly only gives out burning, so it's easy to counterplay with smaller, more granular condition cleanses. There's also the Permeating Wrath, which makes this a very good team fighting build because it gives out more burning the more targets that it hits. So it's really good for team fighting because of this. You're also going to have a decent amount of Condition Cleanse from Absolute Resolution and you also have Purging Flames and that will give your team as well as you some cleansing. So it's pretty good in team fights because it scales up not only with the damage that you do but also with the support that you do. You can also cleanse your allies with Save Yourselves and also you can go into Renewed Focus and give your allies your very strong Dragon Hunter Virtues twice. Now you don't really want to be using your Virtue of Justice or your Spear of Justice because then it'll stop procking your Burning, which is every three hits you'll give out a Burn in an AoE. So yeah, you generally don't want to be using your F1, but if there's a situation where you're like, I'm probably not going to hit that much anyways, and this can guarantee some Burning, and you know that you don't want to do like an AoE situation in the next 17 seconds, then it's pretty good. Also, in Dragon Hunter, you're going to have a little bit more cover conditions with the Zealot's Aggression. So whenever you're permeating Wrath procs, it'll also give out Cripple, which isn't the longest Cripple to be honest. It's pretty short, but it's, it's good enough to give you a little bit of cover condition here and there. I also put on a Sigil of Doom to give a little bit more cover condition here. You have the Sword 2, which will give out a little bit of Blind. And you can also give out some vulnerability and immobilize with Chains of Light. And you just have more burning here with your Purging Flames. So there's not too much cover condition here, but it's a decent amount. So you basically want to, what the combo is, is you'll use your symbol and then you'll immobilize the target with your Chains of Light. Then you'll swap to Sword, you'll pour it in with the Sword 2 and then just spam your Torch 4 and then you'll pretty much do all of your damage very quickly and you can go 
in between with like a purging flames. You can even use your Spear of Justice and your Shield 5 to knock targets in and out of the purging flames to give out really long stacks of burning. But for the most part, this is a very burst oriented burn build, except in team fights where you can just scale up the damage very easily just by hitting multiple targets. As you can see, my team comp really consists of no support. The Scourge could potentially be seen as a support, but not really. And on Legacy of the Foe Fire, which is the map that favors big team fights, you're going to really want to have support. So we're kind of in a disadvantage here, unless the enemy team doesn't have any support themselves. So I jump on the enemy necromancer here just to try to pressure them off because necromancers do lack a lot of shroud at the start but we have a target here and I go on that instead I use my virtues to try to support my teammates and I put down my heal trap to try to basically prevent myself from dying while also kind of like seeing if my team is going to follow up on this kill and they do we get the down but I know that I'm probably not going to be able to chase the next kill because I'm kind of lacking in mobility because I used all my cooldowns. Basically I want to be watching the node while my cooldowns are coming up because I don't have the resources to really go aggressive. So the enemy team is now coming in. I have my resources, my cooldowns, and I see that the enemy guardian is kind of low here but my teammate is kind of fighting on those. So I want to fight with my team even if it's not the right target because the right target is really what your team is on. It's not what is best for your team to be on. So we do end up losing our Scourge there and I, I can't get that res even though I take all of their conditions. So I'm just trying to survive here by counter pressuring and if they really go too aggressively on me they might possibly get killed to get a nice yeah this is a really good heal trap here and i'm trying to trade here but yeah it's very dangerous we actually get the down because i trade so aggressively there and risk my life which allows my teammates to survive so this is kind of like a situation where you either play passively to try not to die because you're in a disadvantaged situation and then you die anyways because your teammates are going to die first or you risk your life to try to get a kill and have a potential of winning so there is this kind of like idea of if you don't fight then you're going to die anyways so here yeah i'm getting really pressured i have the enemy thief on me and i'm just gonna die here so that's I mean, I, yeah i stopped the stomp here but it's not enough time for my team to get the kill on the enemy core necro and rally me so i'm gonna die here and my team is currently, yeah, so we're losing mid. We are stalling home, kind of. And then far is probably losing. So we're not in a very good situation on the map right now. So right now I'm going to try to, I should probably go into home and get those kills there. But I also know that my teammate left far and they actually went to mid and died. So yeah, we're in a really bad situation here now. So instead of going to mid or far, I should probably go into home. My team targeted the enemy thief as if to say there, there's kill potential here, but there really isn't. So I go into mid to try to support my other dragon hunter here. I use my torch 5 to cleanse them and try to keep them alive with my virtue of courage, but they kind of just stay there and immobilize and they don't really have any cooldown, so they just die. I am going to go into home. I get Spear of Justice, so I'm trying to get out of that. And yeah, I'm going to be heavily outnumbered here, so I'm just kiting away from the node. Rather than kiting towards my team, I'm trying to split the enemy team. So I'm sort of playing the role of a duelist. That allows our team to kind of like finish up the kills at home. And now I am kind of stuck in a 1v1 versus a roamer, which is a thief, which is very dangerous because even though I can definitely win the 1v1 versus this thief, I'm not really confident that I can win it in a manner that is going to give us better positioning on the map because the thief can just leave and if I win the fight, 
even if they they leave and don't die, I can get the node, but they'll just go and leave and, and kill the rest of my team. So I do have to kind of, well, first of all, I have to not die here. So I play very safely and jump over the ledge. I get my F1, so I try to stay in range. And while doing this, I pull them and then try to dodge so that they can't steal to me because 600 range is the daredevil steal. And I land a really nice torch four which is going to basically take them uh, most of their life. So I'm staying out of steel range, and yeah, as I said, they would leave, go to mid, and probably kill my team because they're not in a very good situation here. So our Dragon Hunter goes down again, and I see that they have a down on their team, so I go for the cleave with the symbol. It doesn't actually rally my teammate, so they're going to die as well. So this is going to be a difficult match because when you're, you're kind of like scoring kills like that and your teammates are not really capitalizing off of it then yeah it's going to be difficult as a DPS. So you're going to really need a solid 1v1 or 2 to overcome the lack of you know snowballing and capitalization on kills. Here I get a really nice torch 4 on the down body of the necromancer and at this point I'm just trying to bait them to attack the down body so that I can cleave them but they don't fall for it and they still die anyways to my mesmer which gets a lot of damage out there and I'm going to actually pull them back so that my team can get the kill on them very good situation for us because now we've got kills on the map and we can rotate into far as you can see my mesmer is going in there we've got mid and yeah this is a pretty good situation so our team is kind of like watching mid and we are rotating three into far against this one druid. I land my F1 so that they can't go into stealth, even though pretty much my F1 is my damage. I really don't wanna be using that usually, but I try to do it to secure the kill, but we don't secure the kill. So it ends up being kind of a bad play because now we're in like a 2v3, or is that a 3v4? Can't really tell. But yeah, I think there's four here, so we're definitely in a dangerous situation here. And I want to try to cleave out the down body, but they have a sanctuary up. So I'm waiting till the sanctuary goes down, and then I'll go in for the cleave. But yeah, the sanctuary lasts so long that it's really hard to actually interact with that with this build. It's actually a case where it would be better to be running the uh, symbol uh, guardian with the zeal trait line with the sword because that can cleave from afar so yeah actually I usually say that that build is worse because it has like really no sustain on that build but yeah in that situation well you can't really say that because I wouldn't have survived long enough if I was running that build to even be in that situation so yeah it's maybe questionable whether that would have been better in the situation and maybe hindsight or cherry picking rather so I try to survive as long as possible, but we do actually get mid and home, which isn't terrible. I mean, it is pretty bad that I'm dead and getting bled out here because they're going to immediately die and probably lose the node on mid as well. But yeah, I mean, we're still holding on and my Mesmer is going to decap far, which isn't bad because we're going to lose mid no matter what because Mesmer can't really prevent that and home is probably the place that we want to be regrouping or far we want to be playing side because mid is basically a death trap for our team at this point we've realized that our team doesn't really do well in large fights so we end up deciding to go far there's actually a down there which is really nice for us to try to come in and get the kill here our dragon hunter is probably going to rally that immediately but we can get a lot of conditions on the body before they fully revive they use their invulnerability and the thief and yeah the other necro arrive i hold my sword to there to follow the thief and now we're kind of like in an outnumbered situation i link and so yeah there's a really good torch four there and the enemy team is now going to yeah they're going to try to res this i use my elite there to try to get all of my cooldowns back so I can handle the situation and I yeah I get my F1 and I stun break the fear now I pull them in so that my mesmer can do damage so I'm kind of like sacrificing my damage to help my team do more damage there but 
we are kind of like in a 2v3 now. Our team has a kill at home, it looks like, but they're in a 1v2. So the situation is very dire because the match is starting to get towards the end of it and it's very close. Um, I do want to go for the kill on the thief, but I know the thief's just going to kite me. So I go for the cap on the node instead and hope that my mesmer comes to me to get peels. Now, at this point, we're 2v3, so this is going to be a bad situation either way. My mesmer survives, and I have my cooldowns coming up. So I can survive a little bit longer, but not really long enough without the help of my team. So I'm just going into kite spot. Hoping my team survives, but we actually, yeah, we're doing okay at mid, but really if you think about it, we shouldn't be 2v1ing that mid there because anyone can hold that. It's mid legacy. It's a very easy node to hold, so we're kind of like 4v5 on the map right now, to be honest, because we're, we're wasting resources heavily. So yeah, that allows the enemy team to be defending their home node and also the far node. So they're like playing sides on us now because we're over committing and that's not really good for us because um, yeah we're gonna need a lot more points to start winning this. And here I get destroyed by the staff 4 which transfers all my burns so that is very unfortunate and that's probably going to cost us the game because I actually died there and um, yeah, we're going to probably get some kills here, but I don't think it matters because it's going to take too long for us to get the kills on mid and we're actually dying. Yeah, we're actually dying at mid. So, our Mesmer can't really hold that 1v2 for long enough. And we have our Necro as you can see is yeah, I'm trying to tell them to go into mid or to rotate further into the map because it's not a situation where you want to be holding one node. It's a situation where you want to be progressing the map because we are behind not ahead so I push into far and the necro and the guardian we can actually kill them I take a lot of conditions off of my allies and then I cleanse them on myself and now we can just play very aggressively but we need to decap the node so we can't just be chasing kills we need to stay on the node and prevent them from holding the node because that will mean that they just basically get the rest of the points for the kill but they are going for the res off the node. So what I'm trying to do here is bait them off the node and then switch and jump back on the node and get the decap. But it's not enough because I get pulled off and we lost the other nodes anyways. But that's pretty much Burnt Guardian. And finally, we're gonna go over a Flamethrower Scrapper build. And this is a power DPS which simplifies most of its damage into the flamethrower auto attack which is flame jet which is a very wide aoe kind of like cone you know just do tons of damage in many hits in front of them so you can basically just camp your flamethrower auto with the juggernaut trait because you'll be pulsing stability and might on yourself and then there's a lot of passive traits that'll give you might over time and just passive sustain so that you can do your damage and survive at the same time. So the idea is you have Berserker Amulet because you want the most damage, you want to be in those team fights, and the more damage you do, the more that you'll get back in Barrier because of Impact Solvent, so 15% of your damage becomes Barrier on yourself, so it's really good. And then you have Rune of the Chronomancer, there's only 3 gyros on this build, but you still get quickness whenever you cast a well, which gyros are wells. And that'll allow you to do a lot more damage because quickness is really good for power builds, especially one where you have renewable damage. So I take Courage Sigil and Purging because Courage helps you to keep up your might passively, and so does Purging. And I'm using the rifle, not the hammer, because this build needs CC to be able to land its damage. because the the issue with Flamethrower is that its damage is kind of predictable and it just is in front of them so they can't really hit someone who's really mobile. So this build, how it gets its CC is through the Flamethrower 3 skill which is a knockback and then through the rifle which has a lot of CC on it as well from the net shot which is a 2 second immobilize and the overcharge shot which is a very long knockback, but it will also knock you back. So what you gotta do is wait till you get stability from your flamethrower, 
and then you can leave, use overcharge shot, and then go back into flamethrower. And often what the combo is, is you'll either land your overcharge shot with stability so that you knock the enemy back and not yourself, and then you'll jump shot on top of them, and then you'll immediately net shot, or you'll blunderbuss, and then you'll go into spamming flamethrower auto attack, and the flame jet will just do tons of damage in big team fights. You have Fury on this build as well, so Fury and Quickness, very good boons for power builds. And you'll also deal more damage and have a higher chance to crit when you go into that 300 range threshold, which your auto attack is actually a 400 range threshold. So you don't really want to be at maximum range unless you need to be. You want to be kind of close with the flamethrower so that you'll get the Fury, which will give you Ferocity, and the crit chance will kind of get you to like 100% crit chance really so it's a lot of damage and modifiers on this build you also will have object in motion so you have permanent stability you have pretty good amount of swiftness on this build so you can blast there's a lot of combos with the flamethrower 2 which is a blast finisher you can use that in your function gyro which will blast swiftness and then you can also use your medkit 5 which will give a blast and even more swiftness. So you can give yourself a lot of swiftness. So you can pretty much have stability, swiftness, and there's also a lot of super speed on this build. And each instance of those gives you another 5% more damage, which is a big modifier. So you do want to be kind of like keeping up your swiftness rotations in between. It's The build looks like it's just pressing one, but there's a little bit more to it than that. And... You'll also have applied force, so whenever you have over 10 might, you will gain quickness, and then while you have quickness, you'll have 200 power. So with Chronomancer Rune, you'll have a higher quickness uptime, and that will allow you to do a lot more damage on this power build. And you also have the Bulwark Gyro and Purge Gyro. This is basically a barrier, and this is your Condi Cleanse. Generally, you don't get much Condi Cleanse on this build, and the three skill in the med kit gives a four pulsing condi cleanse which is also a water field which you can blast with your flamethrower to get more sustain other blasts and combos i talked about was the swiftness blast you can do with your flamethrower you also have sneak gyro which is really good because if you get focused on this build you're pretty much dead meat if you don't have a support so the sneak gyro really helps you to survive and you can also blast the sneak gyro with your flamethrower too, or you can even leap through it with your jump shot. So yeah, there's a lot of combos that you can do on this build. It's not just using flamethrower auto, but yeah, it can be simplified to that. And also your heal skill is bandage self, which is a pretty low cooldown and will give you 12 seconds of super speed. So on a 17 second cooldown with 12 seconds of super speed, you can get object in motion very often. And it'll give you a lot more sustain than any other of the heal skills. And then you also have defense field, which you can use as well with your overcharge shot to give you stability, or just the projectile reflect is really good. And just the fact that you have function gyro is a really strong support for your team in team fights because those are the situations where stomping and playing around downstate bodies is very important. And what you can do is often when your ally goes down, you can function gyro to help res, but then you can counter pressure with your flamethrower auto attack. You can also do like chemical field to put poison on downstate bodies so that it's harder for the enemy to res and then go back to cleaving with your flamethrower. You can also put out a blast into your poison, which will give weakness to help you peel for yourself. So there's a lot of combos that you can do on this build. And yeah, you just kind of have to get experience with the build to learn that there's more than just flamethrower auto attack. So as a DPS scrapper with the flamethrower, I'm gonna want to give my team stealth at the start of a match because we don't have a thief. So I do the stealth gyro, I blast it for even a little bit more stealth. And then I'm going to prepare off to the side a little bit of my damage. So I see the target is the minion master, I think it is. And yeah, we're going to just cleave out all these minions. As you can see, I have a lot of barrier just from doing a lot of damage, but my teammate immediately dies. So we're playing a little bit safely here. 
but the minion master is pretty close to dying so we're going to keep pressuring them I go off to the side and do a little bit of yeah, I weaken these minions so that they don't pressure me as much, and I just try to kill them out so that I can basically focus on the minion master. Give myself a little bit of sustain there with the med kit, and then I go in with the knockback from overcharge, and it looks like they're getting supported, so it's going to be hard to get the kill here even though we've killed out the minions, but we get a really nice knock from the greatsword of the mesmer there. And I think they're in downstate here because I see that I'm getting barrier while I'm shooting into the stealth area that they were in stealth. So yeah, you can see I'm getting a lot of barrier and that means that I'm hitting them in stealth. I see there's a little bit of a smoke field there from like a thief. So I just keep cleaving that out just to make sure nothing happens that can swing the tide of this fight. So I start capping because my Mesmer is a roamer and I don't want them to be capping. So that's better priority there. And after I cap these, we have a trip cap. So we're in a really good position. I use my jump shot to move around the map a little bit faster and to get into this fight at far. So I'm going to be using my flamethrower here to shoot through the wall of the ramp there just to, yeah, you can see I'm hitting through the wall here just to cleave out these minions. But yeah, it's just one thing that's really good with the flamethrower is that it can actually hit through the walls. So very good for kind of like being not counterplayable because if an enemy is trying to chase you and you move through the wall, you can be hitting them while they can't be hitting you. And yeah, this is a very tanky class here, but because I am the flamethrower scrapper, I'm actually the counter to that because the more damage that I do, the more sustain that I get and versus like more bursty roamer classes this build doesn't fare very well. I start to try to survive while using my snake gyro here which allows me to get a little bit of sustain and yeah we can go in for the kill once I use all of my healing skills. I use a little bit of the rifle overcharge there to try to secure the kill but all is really needed is the flamethrower auto there. And because I have the pulsing stability, I can easily get a stability stomp and go back and help my Mesmer, which is, I think, getting chased by a thief. So I go for the res with the function gyro here while I'm decapping the node. And the thief also has, yeah, the thief is trying to cleave while also the, I think there's a necro on my back as well. So there's a lot of pressure that I'm taking here. And I'm so close to getting the res, but it's just not enough. So. We end up having to leave and the enemy thief is probably going to chase me here. So I need to be very careful. I get blinded and I try to remove the blind with my own blind. I use the overcharge shot to get them off me really quickly and that gives me enough time to get into my sneak gyro which allows me to resustain and I do a little bit of a blast finisher there to give myself some healing and I can basically get out and survive. However, I am low and see that I'm still in combat, so yeah, the thief is still chasing me, so I have to play very carefully here. And I'm just going to give up the node immediately, because a thief can really pressure me a lot if I'm not careful here. So I'm waiting for the sustain. I put up my defense field to prevent the cluster bomb from hitting me, and now I know that the thief is going to jump on me when they stealth here, so I use my bulwark gyro preemptively. I get a 10,000 flamethrower auto there is really good but then I get plus one by the hollow so this is a very bad situation I actually land my heal which is very lucky but then I just die immediately after so that was a pretty good job of surviving by me but it was just kind of unlucky that I also was outnumbered because as I said DPS builds really shouldn't be in 1v1s because they can get easily you know, 2v1 and they can't survive as easily so I'm respawning here very soon and my team is doing pretty okay at mid because it's not like my death was for nothing because while I was 1v2 they were outnumbering mid. As long as you don't die for free, which I didn't really die for free, I would say that the, you know, the hollow had to spend quite a bit of time and the thief also was probably chasing me out from a losing fight anyways. So yeah, it was, it was a pretty good situation for me to be honest. 
because we ended up winning mid. So here my Mesmer is going for the 1v1 on their hollow. I go in stealth and land an overcharge shot and just do my flamethrower auto for like 5k while they are overcharge shotted. So the CC is really important. It allows us basically to get all of your damage off on foes who actually know how to play around you by using movement. So yeah, really important to have that rifle for the CC. And now we're going to be capping the node because Romer has less priority than a DPS for capping nodes. And we're looking at our, so our teammate is 1v1ing for the buff there. I don't really want to go there because I don't have that much mobility for it. So I'm going to go too far. I see that we're already dying at far and the enemy is respawning. So we're going to be at a disadvantage here because our respawn is further away from their home node than our, you know, their spawn is. So I'm cleaving this downstate body here and we actually get, yeah, we get a lot of downs here. I do like a 12,000 chain of the flamethrower, which allows us to get a lot of kills here, even though it's technically a disadvantaged situation. So I go down to like some random uh, minion condies, but my team is going to be here to prevent that. And yeah, I just blast out some medkit combos for some swiftness and move into mid. At this point, I'm probably worrying about the enemy thief because I could get one shotted at any point, but I'm also kind of worrying about my necro if they're because they were dealing with a downstate ranger, just making sure that they're okay here. I do know that they have respawns as well, so I might as well stay here. And we're gonna be 2v1ing this minion master. I'm trying to cleave out their minions. You can see how much barrier I'm getting as well, just from pressing my auto attack. And I do a little bit of a knockback here. I believe that was the thief. Yeah, there's a thief here. And we're going to be 2v3, so I really don't want to be here on this node trying to hold it. So yeah, my teammate is kind of just dying there to the thief. And now I'm in a 1v3, so I'm just going to give myself more stealth. I try to give a little bit of a res there with the function gyro, but that's not going to work out. So I leave with the sneak gyro, I go into mid. And... Now we're in like a 2v2 here until the enemy rotates from far into mid. So we got to play very aggressively to try to get an advantage as soon as possible before we become outnumbered. So yeah, the enemy is starting to rotate in now. I try to knock them away from the downed Tempest that we actually get the kill on. And yeah, this is the one situation where my build shines. Cleaving out downstate bodies or people trying to res them. And yeah, we just get so much damage from yeah these these players are playing builds that don't really have a lot of mobility so when you play a build that does a lot of damage it's easy for you to land it on someone that doesn't have a lot of mobility so i blast a little bit of swiftness here i go into far i realize that we're losing home but it's a little bit too distant from where i am so i end up going into far and now that forces me into a 1v1 with a Condi Ranger, and I've only got like two Condi cleanses on this build, so it's very dangerous. I pop the uh, defense field to prevent getting the Sharpbow poison on me and stuff like that, and I'm just using the rifle here to try to CC them. I force them to use their skills to Condi cleanse them, which means they don't use them optimally, and then while I am Kind of like condied here i go into stealth and then use my med kit heal combo to try to resustain and then once i resustain i can go in with just the flamethrower auto get the stab stomp and yeah, i think at this point this is a one game so yeah that's pretty much how dps in general works and if you have any more questions leave them down below also click on the links in the description below and if you want to support me, you can do so by either sharing this content, you can become a patron. So I have a Patreon now. If you want to see any of the other class roles or rotational roles, then check out the playlist in the description below as well. And I will see you guys next time.